Uh, hello everyone, thank you for coming to our Design Expo presentation. We are the School Protector Team. My name is Nicholas DePinto. This is Chris Joy Tan, Joshua Van Buren, and Yen Hong Lei. Uh, so, during our presentation today we'll be talking about our product called School Protector, and these are the seven major areas that we'll be covering. First thing we want to talk about is why are products important and what's the purpose for it? A common uh, concern amongst a lot of uh, school officials and parents for uh, students in grades K through 12 is safety. Uh, many schools within the US are prone to natural disasters like fires, earthquakes, tornadoes. In fact, thousands are located in danger zones for uh, for. Uh, flooding or even hundreds are located in tsunami hazard zones. However, what we're mostly concerned with with our product is school shootings. In fact, in this graphic here we're showing the number of uh, unfortunate deaths that have occurred throughout the past 40 years. The largest being in 2018 with a total of 56 deaths. And as you can see, there's a, there's a rising trend in the number of deaths and incidents that are occurring. So what we hope to do, and our belief is to mitigate this issue, is to provide assessments. We believe that knowledge is power in our team. And so we want to make sure that school uh, administrators are more aware of the safety capabilities of their schools. And uh, so when we talk about in a, an assessment, a school assessment, we're talking about a way for administrators to know what are the different types of safety objects in their schools and how safe these objects make their school. To provide a little bit more clarification though, what do we mean when we're talking about a safety object? Well, if you look at this uh, double panel door over here, we see that it's actually made up of several different components that we're calling safety objects, like a door hinge, a window, a panic bar, and then the actual door itself. And uh, during an assessment, each one of these individual components in its own way provides a safety that affects the overall school uh, and how it provides safety to the students. And there needs to be one form for each one of these individual components. Uh, so each form would be an assessment form. So our solution, how we want to deliver these assessments for our customers. We are creating this product that we call School Protector which will store all this information for our users, the information being the assessment forms, and then give our users a way to uh, look at the different reports on these assessments and see these safety scores so that way they have a way to compare the safety quality of maybe different doors in their school or different windows. Give them an idea of just how safe are our actual windows and doors. To give you a better idea, we have a video demonstration of our product in action. Oh, oops. So here we see the login page where users can sign in, authorized users can sign in using their Google account or even an email.
type of object, along with the different possible values for each one of those attributes. So let's get into a, a few more details actually about our product. For a product, we foresee that there are four different types of users who will actually be interacting with our application. The, uh, the first type would be an application administrator, or AA for short, also sometimes known as a designer. This type of user will be in charge of uh, creating and managing the different types of generic objects you saw generated in our video. They will also be in charge of adding new schools or districts that want to also sign up with our application. Next are organization administrators. These would typically be your school principals or maybe even superintendents, people who have authority within a school and are the ones in charge of like managing just that one type of school. Uh, they will be in charge of adding the assessors, the people who walk around and actually assess their school, and they can view the reports that are results of those assessments. Then our assessors, as I mentioned before, they are security officials, people who are either hired or maybe volunteered to walk around the campus, go room to room, and start reporting all the data that uh, creates that assessment. And during that assessment, they can also add new uh, rooms or buildings, so that way they don't have to wait for, say, an OA to do that for them. And then lastly, we have the viewer role, which just gives a user the ability to view the reports that are generated. So now here in uh, this graphic, we're just showing the different components of our software system and how each one interacts. The three primary components though that we want to talk about within our web application are the front end, back end, and the version control. Now the front end is the part of the application that you, the user, get to interact with on your computer. And uh, we created that using Java, the JavaScript programming language and the React framework, which is a framework developed by Facebook that is uh, very popular widely used amongst uh, web application development practices. Then for our back end, this is all the nifty little logic that's happening behind the curtains that you don't get to see. Uh, it takes all of your data as a user and decides how to uh, bring that to the front end. Uh, and for that, we used a product called Firebase, which gives us the capability to create that database and define the functionality that happens behind the scenes. And then for version control, uh, that's where we store our source code that defines the functionality for both the front end and the back end. And uh, we decided to use a product called GitLab, which in addition to doing all that, helps us collaborate better as a team uh, to make sure that uh, none of our code changes conflict with each other. And uh, also gives us a backup in case anything happens on our machines with, uh, with the source code. And now we talk about the front end portion of the project. So before we perform the live demo, uh, I'll be talking about the little the pieces of the application so it's easier to understand the flow of information. So there's a lot, there's many different levels that a user goes through to get to an object. So if they start off with a district. They are they see a list when they open the app. They see a list of districts that they um, have access to, and then if they select a district, they can all of the schools within that district. And it keeps going on when they select the school, they can see all the buildings within each school and then all the rooms within each building. And then finally they get to um, the objects, the safety objects. Um, for the safety object, there's two components. There's the metadata and the non-metadata. The metadata describes um, the object in a way that the user can differentiate between oh, this is the front door, or the main entrance door, or the back door, or something like that. And the non-metadata is actually all the components that affect the safety score. So um, like the material of the door, like is it steel or wood, or the swing direction. Um, for, this for this product, we follow Google's material design um, because it's a industry standard that uh, a lot of success associated with, and we also use that design because um, it's very simplistic design and un 
cluttered, so thanks to the app with things. Uh, that's just basically all the uh, rules that we follow to make our UI, which is the user interface. And now I'll be talking about the live demo and the slide while Jacob walks around and shows it to you on um, the tablet, which is the intended device for the application. So when the user goes on their uh, URL, they first see this login page with our logo, and then they can sign in with email or a Gmail account. And then after that, they're taken to this assessor menu page, which lists all the districts that they're a part of. So for here, you see the Chino Valley and the Rio. And if you select on Chino Valley, um, you can select View Schools in there. <laughs> It'll show you all the schools within that district. So we have Chino Valley High, Del Rio Elementary, and Heritage Middle School. And you can either view the buildings within each school or view the report. Um, we have a report on every level except for, yeah, we have a report for every level. It's just the overall report um, explaining all the rooms, um, districts, and uh, schools within each, for each level. Like Chino Valley High, um, I'm sorry, Heritage Middle School, then you see all the buildings within that school, and then again, you can either view the rooms within each building or view the report. Once you select um, building three, you see all these rooms within that building, and then if you select um, 301, room 301, you see this example door that we made, um, you can view the report of it or add it. So if you add a new object, you'll see this page. Hit the add button. Um, so if the assessor would like to add a new safety object, uh, you can press the add button and then it, re it redirects to this page. So as you saw on the video demo, um, he you can first select the type of object that you would like to assess. So, for example, in this case, uh, the assessor selects door object, and then the application will render the corresponding uh, assessor form for door. And as you can see, he can enter uh, metadata like name the object, and also add a description of the object. And at the bottom, he can uh, fill out safety critical data that will uh, generate uh, the safety score. And after the assessor has filled out the assessor form, we'll, he will press the save button and then the, all the data will be stored in our database. And then uh, after he presses the save button, uh, it redirects to the previous page where you can view the report of the object that you just assessed. So uh, it basically shows you all the information that uh, you just entered, and it also contains a safety score at the bottom. Uh, and this is our district report breakdown. So uh, it basically shows you all the information within a district. So for example, all the schools within a district, all the buildings within the school, uh, rooms within the building, and lastly, uh, all the safety objects within the so as you can see, we're using a collapsible UI component uh, to nest all the data to show the hierarchy of the information. And this, this is the designer menu page or the application administrator page where you can view all of the generic objects uh, available at the moment for the assessor to use. And if you click on any of the objects, you can see all of the input fields uh, that are currently on the assessor form for that particular object in this, uh, in this example of the work. And if the designer or application administrator would like to customize the uh, assessor form, uh, you can use this page where uh, you can add metadata attributes on the left and non metadata attributes. And here are all of the features that we've completed on the front end. Uh, we 
can generate assess assessment forms. Uh, we can add new gener generic objects for the assessor to use. And we can assess each district, school, building, and room. And lastly, we can view safety reports for objects, buildings, schools, and districts. And as you saw on the demo that Okay, so now I'll just be going over the back end very briefly. Um, again, this is essentially the data that you, the user, cannot see. So some features completed include user authentication, a database to hold all the data for the user, security rules to ensure that your data is being accessed by correct users, some back end application programming interfaces or APIs to essentially communicate from our website to our database and a website domain name, schoolprotector.co, which you can reach today. So now we'll go over some pending features that we would like to see in some future iterations of this product. So for example, one of the features we would really like to see in uh, another iteration is something called nesting templates. So for example, an assessor would normally have to for the door on the left would have to identify all the separate objects in that door. So for example, the door itself, the window, door hinge, and panic bar. Whereas we see a template that could implement all four of those at the same time. All this would be done to again, streamline the assessment process and make this faster. We would also like to see a feature such as copy and pasting templates. So for example, if a door in the cafeteria is really similar to a door in an auditorium, again, that just streamlines the process of copying and pasting fields so that the assessor can quickly assess. Other pending features we would like to see is a more robust algorithm for generating safety scores. This is currently a research endeavor being done by Professor Tom Foley, um, and there's funding toward being uh, being funded towards this. We'd also like to have the ability to add rooms, buildings, and schools via the website and creating new users via the website. And then we'd also like to implement features, management features for our users, district schools, and for our assessors. Now I'll go over some testing, again, to ensure that we deliver the best quality product to you. So some tests that we've implemented include security tests, to ensure that, again, the, the correct users acts, have a, authorized access to the right data. So out of all 30 tests that we've developed, 30 of them are passing. And then we've also developed API tests to verify that the correct data is being passed to the website that we expect. And out of all 18 API endpoints, or um, just think of them as API um, pieces of data, have been verified and most are being integrated within our website today. We've also developed some acceptance testing to ensure that the features we promise to deliver to you have been met. So currently, we have nearly half of our acceptance tests passing and over half at least partially passing. And within the next iteration of this product, we envision all the tests passing plus some more acceptance tests being generated as more features are envisioned. So, so finally, I'd like to conclude this presentation with just the overall lessons learned during the development of this product. And the number one lesson learned was learning in itself. So learning the technical challenges and the project management was a challenge in itself. Coming from, again, the ground up is, is challenging, but we were able to do it. Um, and then also learning just how to interact with our customers better through our product developing that user experience and user interface to, again, enable the best quality for our customers so that they'll keep using it again. That's something that we learned um, throughout the semester. We also learned that communication with our stakeholders is important. Understanding customer needs um, is, all, is what, how we will deliver that product. Um, and then finally, just project experience overall. Again, meeting deadlines and tasks um, and fulfilling our promises that we want to fulfill um, is one of the bigger lessons we've learned as well. And with that, um, I'd like to open up uh, questions. So I've got a 
question. Uh, so I, 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 I like the architecture. I like the uh, test-driven development and continuous integration approach. And but uh, and that's kind of a new school of thought for these types of information systems, which seems wholly appropriate for what you're doing. Now I'm going to go old school. On <laughs> so I'm looking at this going. It's still a three-tier architecture. So you said front end, back end. Where is the equivalent of a web server in a classic three-tier architecture in your design? Or what, what is that? Is that so what provides that connection between the database and the client? Uh, so as I was mentioning in our major components for our system, for the back end, we have a product called Firebase. And it actually does more than just a simple database with functionality. It even uh, does our hosting for us. So we have a uh, staging environment and a production environment. Uh, GitLab provides a staging environment, so in that sense, it gives us a web server for the prototype of our product. But then the final version, the one that the end users actually see, uh, that is hosted in Firebase as well. So, so Firestore is the NoSQL data management, and yes. Firebase is the equivalent of a web server. Uh, Firebase is uh, the overarching product made up of several different Okay, so if you were to compare it to say like a layup, um, you see what I'm saying? Like a, a classic three or four tier architecture. Mm -hmm. Who provides the web services? Or what element provides the web services compared to that? Uh, it's a feature within Firebase that's just called hosting. Okay, so Firebase provides that. Exactly. And you didn't have to code something there. Uh, you, no. you just worked on the back end, so truly you worked on the back end front end, mm -hmm. and Firebase provided that connector for you. Exactly. Uh, okay. The most work we actually had to do with the hosting was uh, generate the correct certificates uh, that we had to feed into Firebase just to verify, like, yes, this domain name that we are using is our property. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so it kind of collapses it into you only worry about two of the three tiers. Exactly. Awesome. Any other questions? Yes. Did you work with any local schools or anyone that sort of helped define how, you know, what your requirements were? Uh, no, we just did not personally. It was a thought in our, uh, at the beginning. However, uh, as time progressed, we realized that we uh, need to make sure we got some features out the door. So. What we did instead was we focused on uh, just getting the feedback from our stakeholders, being Professor Foley and his research team. They're the ones that are mostly interacting with the local schools going around, actually doing assessments, and they're the ones getting that user feedback, uh, either from themselves or from the schools. So it is being done, it's just that you weren't doing it yourself. We're not directly doing it, no. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm sorry, I guess somewhere along the line, the distinction between Oh, so the metadata is all the information that doesn't affect the safety score. It's actually the information that uh, helps the user differentiate between each object. So it's just a description of more detailed description about the object instead of just the name. And then the non-metadata is actually it's the information that does affect the safety score. Um, it's all like the material of the door or the window or the swing direction. The there's components that actually. Uh, are you expecting the assessor who's uh, designing the safety objects and the, the buildings to have a computer background? And the reason that's is just because the, part of the metadata field was referencing a string type uh, for the metadata. Uh, so the is a string field, that, that I'm assuming that's what you're talking yes. about, correct? Uh, yes, so that wouldn't be the assessor, it would be uh, the application administrator or the designer who interacts with that. Um, However, you are correct in your theory of, uh, I'm assuming you're leaning towards the thought of that they probably are not a computer savvy. And uh, yes, in a, in a future iteration, we would uh, have a better way of describing that to people who may not know exactly what we're talking about when we say is a string. I saw you have a safety score for one object, but you're not currently sort of rolling that up in any way? 
uh, that is uh, in our future plans. So we would like to, you know, have a way of giving a, a grade to a room based on the grades of the objects within that room, and continue that up to the further levels for buildings, schools, and uh, even districts. Yes. More of a comment. Even comment on my comment. It seems to me like the. the the data item that's missing, it strikes me as a big missing, is geographical and uh, not just geographical, but uh, physical relationships between all of this data. In other words, where's it lay in a map, a floor plan or such of the uh, building, uh, if you're accessing or assessing the ceiling, it's vertical, something like that. It seems like there's a, there's a data, 3D database, a geography that's missing in the database. Any thoughts about that? Uh, well, uh, agreed. Uh, geographic location for the objects is definitely a factor uh, for safety. Uh, we did give that some thought beforehand uh, when we started this project, and uh, we determined that uh, it's something that should definitely be considered later on for uh, future capstone teams, but we need to get just the foundations, the basics off the ground first. Um, but it's definitely something we would like to see in the future. For example, we did consider like a map of each room, if that's what you're referring to. That, that's what I'm alluding yeah. to. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to know where the bad, what, what other room does the bad door lead into? Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, where is this hosted? Um, so Basically, what machine is running it? Where? So it's on several machines. That's it's uh, distributed architecture. Okay. Um, but um, I think the documentation specifies where it could be located. Okay. Yes. So let's say you're going to add a feature like Professor Kotmer just asked for mm -hmm. um, with GitLab and your continuous integration process. How would you? Go about that, and could a maintainer of your software do that fairly readily the way you've designed this? Uh, so, for our development process, we've been following uh, an agile methodology. We, from where the software stands right now, if there would probably be, need to be a few more other features put in place first before we got to that level. Uh, but uh, in terms of are you asking about so, so maybe that's a complex feature that that was asked for but let's take something simpler like a new type of object like let's say some schools you, you go there and they have garage doors for coaches yeah <laughs> that take stuff out on the football field and you're like oh we don't have that in there what, what does it take to add that uh, as of right now that can be added with our designer page uh, just okay. by saying this is a garage door and these are the attributes that are, can be associated with a garage door and uh, the different possible values for each attribute. And in your architecture, does that uh, designer page live on the GitLab server, or is it, where is it? The designer page, you mean the source code? Do I just run it on my client system and then upload something to Firebase? Or? Yes, okay. so uh, the designer page, you interact with How do I deploy it, is, is what I'm getting at. Oh, how do uh, other, like Yeah, so I added system? this new object. How do I deploy it now? So how do the assessors end up seeing it? Yeah, uh, so each, using our API endpoints, uh, what would happen is as soon as the designer clicks that little save button saying, uh, hey, I want to save this type of generic object, now it exists within our database. So now every time one of our other APIs are hit maybe by an assessor, uh, that new generic object type will appear on their assessment forms. So it really just goes to the back end, and as you were saying earlier, then it's gonna have a front end presentation that it automatically gets somehow. What if you wanna change the look and feel of that? Every time, yeah, every time the uh, front end updates its uh, information uh, by calling one of those uh, endpoints that Josh was talking about, uh, that information that's available will be updated as well. Okay. Yes. Is the end goal to have safety objects limited to the district level or visible across the entire platform? Uh, it would be. Yes. 
So the safety objects would be available to every user across this application, but when I mention templates, those would be specific to each district. So the designer is a role for the overall application? The overall application, the application administrator as well. Getting back to that picture of the hierarchy that we wandered through of the, the, the system diagram? Yeah, you had a hierarchy oh, of no, the objects, the school, the building, for example, and that structure. Uh, I go. This one? No, no, front end, we intro. Go back and front end. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the bulletized list? Yeah. Yes. Ah. yes. So we have the ability, as you pointed out, to add new object types through the metadata and then non metadata associated with each of these new types, correct? Yes, sir. Can I change further up in the chain? So, for example, under school, the only thing I have to choose are buildings. Supposing I want to uh, enter information that's not a building, like a swimming pool or the soccer field. Can I change the hierarchy that far up? Um, so, theoretically, there's nothing preventing the user from doing that. However, within the naming conventions of, uh, of our application, it wouldn't make as much sense. Uh, that actually was brought up to us before in previous uh, design reviews, and it is another one of our uh, future implementations that we would like, uh, like to see if we can communicate with future capstone reviews. Is there any fundamental reason why I can't, just like you have at the object level, have metadata options at the building level, so I can introduce a new follower and point? Yeah, a new way to yeah. describe a building. Because yeah, so so there's nothing preventing that, and that's that's a that is a good suggestion. This is a, how it's set up. It's dynamic. How it's being gathered. It's a NoSQL database, so there's nothing. There's no relations holding us back from actually adding those fields if desired. So do you have uh, metadata at every level? So. No, currently we just have it at the object level, but if we did want to implement it at the uh, room level or uh, building level, school level, it is possible. Which then could host some of your GIS information. Yes, and then I think that would answer that question as well. Yeah. Is all the data, for example, at the object level private to that particular thread yes. of it? Is there any thought toward creating a uh, correlated database of objects that could be drawn down to any particular building. In other words, and there's, there's no reason why an assessor should describe a door every time they encounter a door. They should be able to draw a door from another database and then perhaps modify its characteristics. That was the copy and paste feature that we'd yeah. like to see. Exactly. That does, does or not, does it, not that, exist in this. Um, So it, it just means that it's listed in our requirements. We just, as a team, are not able to get to it uh, okay. during the course of this semester. So can but, you do like big data analytics where you can, say this gets deployed widely, mm -hmm. and you now want to answer fundamental questions like what's the weak point across all the schools in the United States? And so I'm wondering if you can do queries across a type of object like a door for all schools. That, that um, so we do have an API endpoint called get district data. Um, and then I think, I'm, I'm not, I have to look at the source code again, but I think we could gather all the districts. Um, and the only person who would have access to that would be the application administrator. Okay. And they could analyze and look at every district. Uh, sorry, your question. What if I'm a nefarious person and I want to use this data for bad purposes? So I want to know which rooms are most vulnerable or which doors are most vulnerable. How, how would you prevent that? So um, can you go back to the user rules? Yes. So essentially again, Anybody can assign into our application, but can't necessarily see the application until they're assigned a role. So for example, if you aren't assigned into any of these uh, particular roles, you can't see the data. And with each role, you're a part of a specific district. So for example, a viewer um, can't just be a, a bad guy. Um, it has to be assigned by the organization administrator who gives you privileges to see what's in that school. Um, 
within that specific district. Can I hack in? No. <laughs> <laughs> so to be clear, the viewer is not intended to be the general public? No, the viewer is not. Okay. And have, all these roles must be assigned. Uh, otherwise, we didn't show it, but it pops up a message saying unauthorized. Are you trying? <laughs> Good job. Did you get the message? No, I got a blank blue screen, but I couldn't get in. Oh, okay. Were <laughs> you going to schoolprotector.co? I went to schoolprotector.co, yes, okay, sir. So that is our production environment, and uh, the reason why it's like that right now is we are waiting for feedback from our stakeholders to give us the thumbs up. Before um, we push the staging out to production. Okay. What we were showing you was our staging environment. That's our prototype, is, uh, is another way. So we're just waiting on that feedback before we just push it all into uh, production. Yes. So if not the general public, who are the viewers? Teachers. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's our biggest. Is it parents? Potentially, there there was some risk associated with that. Um, it it could again theoretically be whoever, right? Um, but we did talk about parents, teachers, um, people concerned about specific um, safety aspects, like potentially um, people who are trying to enroll their kids who are interested. That was also a suggestion that anybody really. So, so I think, uh, not to bring the question up again, but I'm not sure I got the right answer for it. So for big data analytics, that would be someone like a, a policy maker, decision maker, someone who funds all the schools in Arizona. Yeah. How do they get access to data where they don't need to know what school has a bad door, they just need to know what counties in Arizona need more money. <laughs> to, right. They, do they just use the score and they don't need to look at anything else? Um, like for auditing? Yeah, or, um, or just, you know, where do you send money in the state to improve the overall state safety? That's a big data question as opposed to... Uh, I might be able to help out with that question. So, <laughs> um, how we can envision implementing that type of feature, that big data feature, would be, uh, as Josh mentioned earlier, creating a, an endpoint for a user. Uh, that sounds like maybe that particular type of use case could fit underneath, say, the organization administrator role. Um, so we would create an API endpoint for them where they can query to say, um, what doors have this, are made out of wood? Or, so it'd be a new role yeah. here that doesn't exist. Uh, it, it could be a new role. Okay. It might be the uh, OA rule. Uh, however, what would need to be done first beforehand would be uh, on Professor Foley's side on his research project. He wants to uh, find a way of uh, standard, create a standard algorithm for, uh, for that safety, uh, or for deciding the safety score. And uh, the way he talks about that in his uh, grant proposal is uh, basically taking the most typical types of maybe doors or windows that are found here in Prescott and uh, seeing how long it takes for him to create a breach um, that might look like setting up, a, uh, setting up a door on a shooting range in front of him and just seeing how long it takes for him to blast a hole that is of a certain size. And once it reaches that size, it's considered a full breach. And then he takes that amount of time and compares that to how long does it take for the local police department to respond to a shooter threat and get to the campus. If uh, the idea being if it takes the shooter a shorter amount of time than the police department uh, to get to the school, then obviously it's a, it's a worse uh, score than if it takes the shooter a longer amount of time. So with that in mind, he can start to uh, attribute quality to certain aspects of the door, and then we can create an API endpoint for our, maybe, maybe this would be the OA users to query, say, okay, um, it's been shown that doors made out of wood don't stand a chance or uh, are less safe against these types of weapons. Let's see how many doors are made of wood within the, dist uh, the district, and then they can start to see, um, okay, so these are the doors that need to be changed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So 
So I, I would suggest that you think in terms of instead of copy paste per objects, think in terms of inheritance or something like that, where you're building a library of basic objects and then you're, you're only dealing with, the designer only deals with slight variations from those sort of library of, of types of doors, for instance. Otherwise, trying to go back and assess later what a generic object door that goes into the cafeteria really is so that you can assign a value to it is going to be very hard. But if you, if you inherit from a steel frame door with one thin bulletproof glass window and a push bar on the side, and then from that make a variation of it, say it's a double door of the same type, or something like that where you're inheriting in such a way that then when you go to query it, you can find all those things that are inherited from that and therefore more easily assess the actual safety of that object, as opposed to a lot of generic objects that get defined that except by name, there's no way you're going to be able to tell tell what it is and be able to you know, assess it. Yeah, agreed. Um, we had thought about that. How how do we want to tackle handling the data in our application? We decided that with the amount of time given to us uh, sure. for the semester, uh, no SQL database with uh, with uh, res uh, relationship restrictions on our data was the fastest way we can get something out the door. Um, sure. With class inheritance, we perceive that as something with a little bit more complexity to it um, that could be handled by a later capstone team. Uh, but I uh, agree that it does. If you start entering a lot of data, that data may end up being invalid later on when you try. In other words, if you do it early on before data gets entered, mm -hmm. you can then preserve the data later when you make other changes. So it's just a thought. Sounds like you've already thought. No, thank you. Yes, uh, Professor Randall. So, so there's a, a concept of semi-structured data where you have information about information on information, etc. And, and one of the things that that allows you to do is record if there's an assessment done, who did the assessment, and when did they do the assessment. Did you give any thought to this additional level of metadata? Yes, we did. Um, so the thought was with most of our API, our, our system is API driven. With most API calls, um, we would associate a timestamp with each object, and there's an actual there's an actual data type for time, which is sort of what we consider to be for each assessment. Uh, so I think uh, you mentioned next nice capstone deep capstone team. Um, how are you archiving this work to date for the next team? Uh, yes, so we have a. Uh, uh, configuration management library where we've been uh, storing our documentation for this project. Uh, I'm not sure if we have an image of our different documents. I'll briefly look at that. Uh, let's see. We kept that in our backup slides. Uh, <coughs> here we go. So this is our family tree of different documents. Uh, associated with our product and where they fit based on uh, subcomponents as well. And uh, the idea here is that this library of documents will be available to future Capstone teams if they want to pick up uh, where we left off okay. and just help them get to a, to a faster start than uh, we did. So that way they don't have to work from ground zero. So those documents will show up in the CML? Yes. Or they have already? Uh, they are in the CML, and they are just awaiting approval from our QA. Yes, sir. So, so this is more of a theory question. So you, you took more of a semi-structured key value document collection approach. Mm -hmm. You arrived at that somehow. Why did you reject relational or OO, highly structured approaches? Uh, um, so the idea was, again, we weren't sure what types of data was going to live for our objects. And so having something that can expand easily, um, adding new pieces of metadata and non-metadata is important. Having that dynamicness uh, to our database is really important. And with SQL, it's really difficult, we found, to maintain those relations and keeping um, the data straight, essentially. So NoSQL was the way to go for us. 
And, and that was partially through interviewing your customer, as yes. came to that conclusion. Yep. Okay. Yes. Why do you guys choose to do a web based compared to a downloadable application? Uh, the idea there was cross form uh, or cross platform compatibility. Uh, so right now we know that uh, Professor Foley and his team like to work off of those Windows Surface tablets. Uh, however, we we thought it would be best if, uh, in case maybe they wanted to do it off their cell phones or maybe a different type of tablet, uh, in case of that situation later on, we still want it to be available to them. What tends to be the case with a lot of mobile applications or tablet applications, they're all platform specific. I can't uh, make an app, I can't make a mobile app for an iPhone and expect to immediately see it on a, on a Google phone or an and, any other type of Android phone. We'd have to recreate that source code in a new programming language and then get it uploaded uh, to that other type of app store. There are other ways to, you know, people have made different tools for porting or translating that source code so it's easier. Uh, we just thought for a first run prototype of this application, it would be best and most available to our end users if it were a web application. Uh, any further questions? Uh, oh, was that a, no, sorry. <laughs>